So good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. And uh, tonight, I hope I can provide some new information for you. And on, t on tree problems, tree pest problems, we can't cover everything. It's kind of funny that I, I get this topic, and of course, we can go for days, if not weeks, on this topic. So we'll cover what we can. I, I want to hit the high points. A few things you can expect to see, especially in the spring, uh, and perhaps a, a couple of big things later in the summer, uh, but the things we expect to see, especially this spring. And the first thing I want to point out is, is winter injury and winter damage. Uh, depending where you are in North Dakota, spring has sprung uh, or it hasn't. Uh, some places where it's still awfully cold. Um, there's some places where they've already planted wheat. So uh, it's it's kind of all over the place, but let's talk about uh, winter injury. And winter injury on conifers is a very generic term. It, it, there's a bunch of things that can cause winter injury. But what we see is some level of this, some level of needles turning brown and dying, or in this case, kind of a, almost an orange gold. Uh, this is actually in my own yard uh, outside of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Uh, that was 2014, a ponderosa pine. And so that was a long time ago. But then in 2019, yeah, five years later, saw the same thing on the tree. Tree's going great. Uh, 18 inches a year, if not more. So trees uh, can take some damage. And last year, what I saw was this quite a bit. Uh, it tended to be on one side, uh, on the, I think it's the south side, yeah, south uh, general side. And needles were turning brown or orange in this case. And some of them were kind of speckled. And we see this on pine trees. We see it on spruce trees. It could be it could be uh, a cold, really extremely cold day uh, for certain tree species that they couldn't handle it. It could be that we had a few warm days and then it got cold again. Uh, it could be just we had a very sunny, dry day uh, with a lot of wind. So there's a bunch of different potential causes. But I want to point out that uh, there's a picture from August. This tree's growing fine. Uh, yes, there is some damage. It's not perfect, but the tree is surviving and actually thriving. It's doing very well. And you'll probably see some variations on this. Now, these pictures were uh, sent to me back in 2009. Uh, Dr. Sam Markell, who's in our plant pathology department, was walking around his neighborhood in Fargo and saw these two trees. And uh, I <laughs> wish I could ask you. Uh, what do you notice in these photos? Uh, what I notice is on the right, uh, the one, that one, there's no needles that are green, um, or almost no needles. There might be a few. It's really hard to tell. On the left side, well, needles that were low, maybe in the foot of the ground, uh, are green, and maybe a few scattered around, but that's mostly brown. And Sam also uh, got a close-up. And it's interesting, these are mostly on the bottom of the branch that are, uh, that are dead or dying. And this spruce tree is another one that he took a photo of. And you notice some of those interior needles uh, turn brown. The spruce tree isn't looking good in general, but uh, there's just another issue that this tree has to deal with. So you're, you might see this on your pines. You might see it on your spruces. Uh, you could see it on junipers even or arborvitaes. But the typical message here is how much damage was there? You know, trees can take uh, a loss of up to about a quarter of their foliage, uh, their needles in this case, or in the summer leaves, with, without even feeling it, you know, without even being stressed. Trees are pretty redundant that way and pretty resilient. So uh, before you get really worried, um, see how much is damaged. The other thing I want to point out, I forgot to point out, I'm going to go back here, is in this example on this pine, if you look at those buds, the buds are pretty unaffected. Uh, those buds are very likely to survive, so the tree will probably send out a flush of new growth without any problems, and that will certainly help the tree recover. So uh, as long as the buds didn't, uh, didn't get any damage or were killed, 
the tree is likely to survive, and in this case, thrive. So that's the first thing you can expect uh, this winter, after winter. And the other thing is we see this every year, uh, rabbit damage, vole damage, uh, sometimes deer. Um, oh, these are buggers. Uh, these were some nice crab apple trees, newly planted uh, outside uh, a place in West Fargo several years ago. And uh, well, at least they let these little critters left some fertilizer there. But boy, they just nailed this and they removed all the bark. And what's going to happen to this tree? This tree's going to die. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. That much bark gone all the way around the stem. This tree is going to die. However, it will probably, the roots, and in this case, the lower stem, will send up sprouts. And that's the tree's way of trying to survive. Uh, the, the roots need to survive. They need the top as much as the top needs the roots. So that's what it's going to do to try to save itself. Uh, the next example, this is actually an apple tree in my own yard again. Uh, you know, I had a friend who, I'm going to give an aside here. I had a friend who once said, oh, you, you probably have the best trees in the neighborhood in your yard. Uh, nope, <laughs> nope. Uh, I I just let them out there, and if they survive, great. And if they don't, eh, I'll plant a new one. They got to be tough with me. In this case, this apple tree was wounded. It was wounded actually not by rabbits. This one was actually uh, birds, sapsuckers, and they nearly girdled it uh, at about mid height there, where I have the word wound in the arrow. And what the tree did is it sent up suckers or sprouts from the roots and from along the base of the stem to get new leaf tissue, new branches out there uh, in order to create, you know, do photosynthesis and create sugar, create energy to survive. And uh, this tree is still there, but uh, slowly recovering. My friend Jim Walla tried a, a technique called bridge grafting on it. And it's tough. It worked maybe. We're still trying to figure it out. So those sprouts are not a bad thing. That's what I'm trying to say here. Those sprouts are helping the tree survive. So you might want to keep them. You might want to train one of them into a new leader. Uh, in retrospect, maybe I should have done that with this tree, trained one of those sprouts into a new leader. Uh, but, in the, but I didn't, so uh, I'll live with what I got. So that's the first thing you're, uh, to expect. The, the next thing I want to point out are canker worms. Um, we have these two pests. They're called spring canker worm and fall canker worm, and they're both spring defoliators. They, they come out at about the same time. They're little caterpillars. And uh, I can't remember which one this is, <laughs> whether it's spring or fall. Uh, I always get the two mixed up, uh, but it really doesn't matter a whole lot because they come out at the same time, they feed on the same types of trees, and they cause the same type of damage. And this is what they do. They defoliate. They eat the leaves uh, or uh, in between the veins, and this is where it starts. You know, it's nice and simple like this. But this is where it ends. They can defoliate a tree quickly. And unfortunately, what happens is we often, um, we often don't notice the damage till it's too late. These insects are easily controlled when they're small or young, but they're hard to notice when they're small or young. So that's a bit of a challenge. And we'll talk a little more about that. Here, uh, a bunch of different deciduous trees or hosts. Um, I just want, I have hackberry highlighted because that's what's in the photo. Uh, what I've often seen them on are box elders and uh, the lindens and the maples and ash as well. But they'll, they'll hit a bunch of trees. And we saw this throughout North Dakota uh, last year. In 2018, two years ago, it was a light infestation. Okay, they were starting to get a little bad um, in central North Dakota, especially. Last year, it was pretty heavy throughout North Dakota, even in the east here, uh, but especially bad in the central part of the state. And I personally expect that 2020 here is going to be really bad for uh, canker worms. There's some control measures we'll talk about in a sec. Um, I also expect that next summer the population might crash. Back in I want to say 2007, 2008, uh, and nine. There was a, a buildup like this, and it was about three years of buildup, 
and then the population crashed and they're just at a very low level. So um, you often see these, these types of bands on trees and the, the trunk banding, they use a product uh, called Tanglefoot. It's, I don't know, it's this real goopy, gluey stuff. And what happens is the, the moths, the female moths of these canker worms, they crawl up the stem and they try to lay their eggs near the top of the tree. The spring canker worm does it in the spring, fall canker worm does it in the fall. And this trunk band really doesn't control the insects so much as tell us uh, when those insects are out. So that helps us uh, figure out when we should try control measures. Um, but on both of these species, the larvae, the, the caterpillars, the timing is about the same. So uh, if, you're, if you've ever raised corn, if you're familiar with the growing degree day model, uh, growing degree days, you need a certain temperature of above a base. In this case, the base is 50. And for uh, every day where the average temperature is above 50, uh, you add what the temperature is. Actually, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to, I'm not describing it well. Look up growing degree days if you want to learn more. And uh, when we get to about 148, just under 150 growing degree days, that's when we can start treating these insects. That's when they're, they're starting to come out and be vulnerable to insecticides. And I want to say control when they're small or young. Usually we don't notice the damage till it's too late. So um, here are a few uh, products that could be used, chemical insecticides. You know, these insects, when they're young, they're actually very susceptible to a number of chemical insecticides. You can use uh, a biorational insecticide like Bt. That would work as well. But again, the timing is really important. Um, You'll notice I have carbaryl or seven in parentheses. They actually changed their formulation a couple years ago. Uh, I think a lot of people have seven in their garage that is probably the carbaryl formulation. Now the new formulation is this zeta cypermethrin. Okay. Uh, one thing we saw quite a bit this last year, I got about five more minutes. Uh, one thing we saw quite a bit last year is fire blight. Fire blight is a bacterial problem. Uh, it hits plants in the rose family. It, it can hit roses. It can hit strawberries even. Uh, I've never seen it on those, but uh, I'm a forester. Uh, what I've often seen it on are apples and crab apples, uh, mountain, a mountain ash, hawthorn, juneberry, uh, catoni aster. Pears, uh, I can get hit by fire blight. I just don't know that I've seen it much. Uh, there's uh, these other hosts, I see it more often. And it's called fire blood because it looks like the ends of the branches have been hit by a fire. Uh, the leaves turn crispy brown, and the very tip of the branch will droop over. They, they call that a shepherd's crook. Um, it, oh, I'm going to go back. They call that a shepherd's crook. And what we often see there is uh, it, sometimes it enters through wounds. You know, let's say there's a hailstorm uh, or a high wind storm and there's some broken branches uh, or, or damaged branches. That's when we often see uh, that's when we often see fire blight hitting the trees. It can sometimes enter through flowers and I've seen that a couple times and that just blows me away when it does that and that's uh, that's really hard hard to control. And what you'll see if you look really close, you'll see a, a canker, Again, this is a bacterial problem, uh, but you'll see a canker where uh, there's a, a sharp margin, a sharp edge between the live tissue and the dead tissue. And uh, you could see in this picture that to the right of the canker margin, there's some tissue that's not quite gray yet, not quite dead. Um, it's dying. It's on its way out. How do you control fire blight? Fire blight's a, a challenge. It's you can try preventative treatments in the spring and uh, in the early season. The the most common ones are streptomycin, which is an antibacterial, and actually copper-based fungicides, which is kind of interesting, that they can be effective against a bacteria. So um, these are preventative, and I say sort of, 
especially after wounds or damage. So keep that in mind. All right. And in dry weather, if there are cankers, if there are fungal, fungal cankers, you can prune them out, but it's a, it's a process to get them all out and get them all out properly. So you need to do this in dry weather, prune out, go at least a foot below that canker margin. Some sources say eight to 12 inches, some say 12 to 18 inches. Um, go back below that to prune out the branch, but leave a stub and they call it ugly stub pruning. And what you do is you leave that stub and you leave it until the winter. You know, mostly we say no stubs, uh, don't, don't leave stubs on trees. Uh, but this is one case where we say leave them for half a season, you know, until winter. And then you, in the winter, you remove that ugly stub. Uh, look it up. You'll find some interesting information out there. There's a lot of good information on this type of pruning. Uh, clean your pruning tools between cuts. You don't want to spread this bacteria. I think I got a couple more minutes, a few more slides here. So <laughs> I know this isn't much. There's a lot of of pests that can hit trees. But as far as treatments go, I want to say this treatment uh, timing is critical. You can spray all the uh, fungicide or insecticide you want, and if it's at the wrong time, it's a waste. It might make you feel better, but it doesn't do anything for the tree. It doesn't kill any of the pests. So uh, timing is critical. So you got to do some homework here. Learn the biology of, of the pest and do some scouting. Check it out. Uh, look for those pests and see where when they're around. Like I said earlier, this is too late. Um, this is too late to treat because the insect is already gone. This is too late to treat. The damage, uh, these are a mite that causes this problem. This is maple bladder gall. Uh, and th these are called areified mites, and there's a bunch of them, a bunch of different types. The damage to this leaf occurred months earlier. The other thing, um, not all damage needs treatment or not all damage needs chemical treatment. The first thing I often hear is what can I spray? And thing is not always the answer. The example, one example I give is uh, on this ash, this little leaflet here, those dots on the right, those little tiny dots, they're speckles. Um, that's that's uh, wounds, feeding wounds from the ash plant bug, and damage is minimal. There's so little damage to that leaf um, that I'm not really worried about it. And then the next thing is, how do the rest of the leaves look? Are they about the same? Are they healthier or are they not healthier? Uh, check out, check out the whole tree. An, an individual leaf or branch that's dying or, or damaged is not much of a big deal. Uh, this example here, Larry, I hope this answers your question. Uh, this is called Valsa canker of spruce. It used to be called Cytospora. It got renamed a couple years ago. Anyway, um, in this type of, uh, this is a fungal canker. In this type of fungus, it's real interesting. It's very closely related with drought stress. If a tree gets drought stressed, a spruce tree gets drought stressed, it's very, susceptible to this fungal fungal uh, fungal pathogen. The, the fungus actually lives within the tree and it's just waiting for the tree to let its defenses down. If the trees are properly watered, not overwatered, not underwatered, blue spruce is kind of in between that way. It's a little sensitive on either end. Um, if it's properly watered, it can fight off cytospora canker. The other thing about this disease is if you see branches like this, there's nothing to spray. There, there's no chemical treatment. Uh, all you can do is remove the branches and, and dispose of them. I have some resources I'd recommend that you take a look at. Uh, we have a brand new publication. Dr. Jan Knodel uh, led that one, Anchor Worms, uh, E999. If you look these up online, you can certainly find these. Just type NDSU extension and then the, the number. Uh, spruce diagnosis in general, F1818. Uh, the needle cast diseases, we just updated that one, oh, I think within the past few months. 
uh, flooding, we looked at that one recently as well, and of course iron chlorosis. Those are the, the biggest main problems. And um, it's funny, I see all kinds of questions starting to come in. And with that, I will finish it up and uh, we'll go to questions. And uh, Tom, how do you want to do this? Oh, you know, you're such an expert here on uh, Blackbird Collaborate Ultra that, you know, you see the questions. So maybe you can just, uh, you you can r read the questions and then answer them. And then maybe if if I see a skip one or two, then I can I can throw that in and ask at the end. Does that work? Well, or what's best for you? I'll, I'll start it out. And okay. actually, I'm going to hand that, that one about Apple maggots off to you in a sec. Okay. Um, it, Larry's question, you asked about cytospora canker, and uh, just answered that one. Uh, rhizosphere needle cast, we actually have two needle cast diseases of spruce trees in North Dakota, both rhizosphere and stigmina. And I would look that up, uh, F1680 here. There's a lot of information in that publication. Uh, controlling it is very difficult. Controlling the stigmina especially is very difficult. Uh, a number of spray treatments have to be applied uh, over several years just to keep it under control. Um, otherwise, culturally, thin out the trees and let airflow go through the trees. Um, and that's about it for, for that one. Uh, let's see, Amy, vole damage, about six inches from the ground. Um, can you save this tree? Amy, it really depends on how much damage there is. If the tree is completely girdled, um, then it's very unlikely. If uh, it's it really a lot of it depends on how far around the circumference of the tree, around the circumference of the stem is damaged. Uh, it's funny the the books say, uh, the books say, well the experts say, ah, if it's it can take 50% damage and it'll be fine, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I personally, I think uh, up to a third of the circumference, it can survive no problem. When it starts to get to be up to a half, eh, it's, that's hard on a tree. When it gets more than a half, boy, that, that's very unlikely the tree's going to survive. I'm not going to say it won't, just saying it's unlikely. Uh, my own apple tree is an example. The tree survived, and it's doing okay. So um, I, I wish I had a good answer or a... Uh, I uh, wish I had a positive answer for that, um, but it's it's hard hard to save those tree uh, those trees. Okay, uh, Lori Sharmer's question about apple maggots. Tom, that's your area. Wanna can you take that one? Sure. Um, okay, Lori. To do it, the way to deal with that is keep in mind that right now the apple maggots are sleeping, and they're going to keep sleeping in the ground until around the fourth of July. That's when they wake up. So for now, what I would do, the most important thing is that I would get all the debris from underneath the tree, any possible debris that could have sheltered the apple maggots. And I recommend that you put up some apple maggot traps. They're available from garden centers and major garden catalogs. And hang up the, they use that tangle foot, that sticky material on a red ball. You hang it in the, apple trees, hang a few of them in your apple tree, and the apple maggot flies will be very attracted to those rabbit, those red balls if they're, if the maggot flies are around. And if you do start seeing those apple maggot flies, and they kind, they kind of look like a, a house fly with uh, striped wings, but when you start noticing them, that's when you have to consider your approach. You know you got the pest, and now you can take action if you want to protect your fruits. So usually a couple or three sprays of an insecticide at about a 10 to 14 day interval will get the job done. But the nice thing about those monitor uh, balls in the tree is that if you don't see the apple maggot flies, that means they're not there, so you don't have to spray your tree for them. That's what I would do, Joe. Okay, great, thank you, Tom. A uh, question there about two Medora junipers planted uh, outside the house get full sun adequately watered last fall one looks fine the other is mottled brown and um, do you wait and see yeah wait and see um, 
hope for the best, but expect the worst. If there's more than 25% of it is brown right now, especially on those conifers, it it might survive, but uh, it's hard to say. And if you planted them last summer, boy, it's it's so hard for those to get uh, established. And that first winter can be really tough on the trees. Um, right now, it's just sit and wait. Yeah, I wish I had a, a better answer for you. Um, I want to talk about this this bottom question here. Uh, rabbits clipping all the branches off of young shrubs, including the tops. You know what? Um, on shrubs, uh, it, deciduous shrubs, you know, they're amazing. They sprout back like crazy. Yes, the, um, the, you've lost the tops of those, but quite frankly, they'll send up sprouts. They should send up sprouts uh, without any problems. Uh, I'm actually uh, planning on cutting down my one of my um, lilacs maybe tomorrow or, or Saturday even at this time of year, even this late, I'm going to cut it down and it should sprout just fine. It should sprout from the roots or those little stubs. Uh, it, shrubs are amazing. They really can come back from a lot of damage. Um, Tom, you want to take that one on cherry trees? Okay. Um, first of all, we have to figure out what type of pest it is. If it's, if it's a sour cherry, I, I suspect this is what we call spotted wing drosophila. It's a, it's a major pest on cherries in our state right now. And um, it's a summertime pest. So this is a hard one to deal with. Um, and I would refer you to, we've got NDSU has a publication that Jan and Esther wrote that's outstanding. And it has detailed information on dealing with it. I think that we're not sure about if this pest overwinters I think most most of the science now points that most of these pests, these these uh, it's like a fruit fly or a vinegar fly technically, it flies in on the winds from the south, and uh, and so that's where the pest comes from. So you just have to do a good job job monitoring, and then you just it's kind of a hard you have to use insecticide to control it. There are very fine meshes that can serve as barriers, but I just don't think that's very practical with cherry trees, even a, a small prairie cherry tree. So I think looking at spotted wing drosophila, and those maggots are edible, by the way, if you don't want to be spraying, it, you know, what the joke is extra protein. But look at that publication. It has some specific insecticides for you to do. That's about all you can do because the pest flies in. Joe? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, actually, I don't see any more questions here. So you know, this is the this is your chance, everybody. You got the tree doctor right here. If, <laughs> if anybody has any questions of a sick tree, here's your your. Uh, uh, they they had easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's too early, Joe. Just wait till those big <laughs> worms come out. You scared them all. It's like Godzilla or something coming after your tree this year. I'm just you know, gonna uh, looking for that. One thing I. I'm going to put this in the chat box. Um, the North Dakota, if you can hear me typing maybe, Agricultural Weather Network, NDON. Uh, NDON. If you go there, you can find information about, uh, of course, weather. You can also find out about these, uh, pro uh, ah, shoot, these models, these uh, mathematical oh. models that predict certain stages of growth. In this case, their corn one actually fits for uh, for canker worms. And I looked on there this morning, and we're not even close to 150 growing degree days yet, even in the southwest where it's fairly warm. In the northeast, we're at zero. So um, yeah, so we, we've got some time. So check it out. Uh, learn about growing degree days. There's some really good, really interesting information out there. Uh, Laura, are there ways to prevent or inhibit ash tree ash seeds? Uh, pretty much no, other than um, making sure the tree is a male. And I, I know that's I don't mean to sound like a smart al aleck here, um, but ash trees are either male or female. And if you have one that has seeds, then obviously it's a female. Um, and what I recommend people beforehand is try to 
find one that are, are males. Um, so there are certain cultivars that are male, um, but otherwise, not realistically. Uh, there is a oh, there are some chemicals, um, uh, plant growth regulators, uh, almost like plant hormones or artificial plant hormones that sometimes control seeds. Uh, sorry, or, or fruit, uh, fruit inhibitors. I don't know if they've ever been used on ash trees, uh, but if you look up Florel and uh, what's the other one, Tom? Um, uh, I don't know. There's shoot. There's a couple of them. Uh, Florel or uh, just look up fruit inhibitor. Uh, there, there are some chemicals out there that will help to do that. I haven't heard that ever being used successfully on an ash tree. I don't even know if it's – Joe, is it a license for that? I'm not sure. You know, actually, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to check that out and see if they're even labeled for that. Yeah, usually it's, I believe, mostly um, apples and uh, right. uh, sweet gum in the southern U.S. They use them a lot on that. Yeah. And, Joe, there's no way you can tell if you have a male or a female when it's young, right? You just – you can't. You just gotta wait uh, unless you. It's yeah, a known it's a cultivar. Right. So that's yeah. why it's wise to buy a cultivar, you know, a male seedless type. Mm -hmm. So that's In a this case. Yep. So, and they don't. Do the seeds really cause much harm to the? They, they just. They don't. They're not kind of more of a nuisance. Kind of weaken the tree a little bit, but they're they're not quite as full in their shade but a female tree is okay right joe female ash tree oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah i have no problem with a female tree, <laughs> male tree. it is what it is um, that's right you know? it's, it's natural and there's nothing you can do about it when yeah. you got, when you got it, a female tree that's just the way it is that's nature yeah. ash, ash trees are dioecious that's the the term when you have separate male and female trees uh box elders are like that cottonwoods are like that as well that's why uh, cottonwoods we have such a hard time with sometimes um, there might be a few other species but those are the main ones yeah all right well, okay Joe. thank you very much we've learned a lot today yeah. and we're we're, uh, we're going to get prepared for the onset of spring and looking for those pests so thank you joe for your you contribution tonight